Good morning. Welcome to our very first ever Calvary Connect online worship service. We're glad that uh, even if, if it is from your living room on your couch that you're able to join us for worship. A couple of announcements before we get started. The first thing we want to make sure that everyone knows is that all of our worship services are going to be online until further notice. That includes every single worship service that we offer. Um, a couple of different places where you can find these services would be um, clcs.org or at our Facebook page, which is Calvary Lutheran Church and School. So not only can you go to these different places to find our worship services, but you can find things like Bible studies. Uh, in the future, we're going to be putting together some chapels. We'd love for you to uh, continue to find ways to engage with us in those places. So we hope you have uh, your coffee and your donuts and that you're comfortable because we're going to begin our worship with our very first song.
flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your At this point in our worship service, we're going to have our confessional song. So we're going to be playing this song called, I Stand Before Almighty God Alone. And during this song, we're going to bring everything to God. We're going to, we're going to bring him our sins, but not only our sins and asking for forgiveness, but we're going to bring him our fears. And we're going to bring him the things that, that give us anxiety. And we're going to bring him our worries. And we're going to stand before him, and we're going to give them all to him. So during this song, uh, if you're not singing, that's totally fine, but we definitely invite you to be thinking about the different things um, that you can bring to your God, knowing that your God is good and that he hears your prayers and that he is a God who works not against you, but a God who works for you. You have always called my name. You have waited patiently. It's your love that's never changed. You know me. You know me. I stand before Almighty God alone. I yield my need to cast the blame or stone. Morning breaking. 
As we bring it all to our God, we should be reminded of the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, in which we're told that he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We don't know how God does it, but we know that we have a God who works for our good. He takes things that are broken and he makes them new and he makes them beautiful. So having brought your confession to God, having brought your, your worries and your burdens, know that God hears your prayer and that he's working for your good and that he's making things beautiful and that he has given you his forgiveness. So at this time, we're going to have a little bit of a change in scenery for our children's message. So kids, we want to make sure that you are leaning in at this point and that you've got your, uh, your focus ready as we invite you for our children's message. So like I said, for, for our children's message, we are taking a little bit of a field trip. Uh, you're, if you're probably noticing that I am in one of the hallways here at Calvary. Uh, the youth room is just right over here. The fifth grade room is right over here. And today, for our children's message, we are going to be talking about Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday is the day that we celebrate Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. And as Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, you have crowds that gather around and they're shouting praise to him. And this is because they know Jesus to be their king, and so they want to honor him. So they do two things. They, they put uh, two different things on the ground. They either put palm branches or they put their coats. And so they lay their coats on the ground so that as Jesus comes down the way, even the animal that he rides on doesn't have to get its feet dirty. It's a, it's a, it's a unique way for the people to be showing honor and praise to Jesus. Now, we weren't able to be there on Palm Sunday, but we can still honor and praise Jesus. Now, he's never going to physically, at least I would imagine, he's never going to physically walk down this hallway. But Jesus is still going to be in this hallway. He's here right now. He's going to be here in the fall when we come back to school. And you're probably not going to lay your coat down on the ground. But he's still here, and we can still honor him and praise him by doing things like loving our classmates, showing love to our friends, trying to be helpful to our friends and to our teachers. We can praise and love Jesus by doing, you know, following the things that he told us to do, you know, listening to our parents and loving our parents. So while we're never going to lay down our coats for Jesus, we can still honor him and praise him with our actions. So I hope you will join your hands and pray with me. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your entry into Jerusalem, and we thank you for not only being present there, but being present in our lives as well. Lord, we pray that we would be able to honor you and praise you with the things that we say and with the, the actions that we do. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today marks the first lesson in our new series called How Great Thou Art. And over the next couple worship services together, we're going to take one piece of art for service, and we're going to draw some parallels and comparisons between the, the piece of work and a piece of scripture. And then we're going to look at those two together and ask, how does this relate to my life? And how, what does this have to has, what does this have to say about what Jesus is doing in my life? And so here's the first piece that we're going to look at. And you've probably seen this before. It's a very famous piece of work. Um, and it's called A Sunday Afternoon on the Grande Chate. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, I did probably just butcher that title. So if you speak French, um, I give you permission to laugh at me just a little bit. Uh, so what we're going to do for the first couple of minutes of um, this uh, message is I want to play tour guide for you for a minute. Now, this, this piece is located in the Art Institute in Chicago. So I'm going to be your tour guide, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the piece as I understand it. 
So this was created um, by a guy named Georges Seurat in the late 1880s. And it took him two whole years to complete it. And that was from uh, 1884 to 1886. So why did it take him so long to finish it? Um, well, as you see it now, you're thinking, OK, that's another piece of art. Looks nice. Um, if you see it in person, you know that it is a massive piece of work. It's actually almost seven feet tall, and it's 10 feet wide. So if you're in the room in which it's displayed, this is pretty much the only thing in that room, because it's so big that it really commands all of your attention and all of your focus. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the context of this painting. This is a, a painting that takes place in Paris on an island in the Seine River, which is just the major river that goes through Paris. And in the, this period of time, let's just say that Paris was not known to look like this. Um, this was a, a, a booming time in Paris in which their population was growing. And it was known for being dirty and overcrowded. So it's very interesting that Surratt takes this landscape and he paints it to look so pleasant because that's not the way that you typically picture Paris at this point in history. So I want to point out this is kind of a reimagination or a recreation of an undesirable spot. The second um, item that I want to point out is that the style of, of uh, art that this is, it's called pointillism. So if you, if you were to stand back, you see you know, the landscape, you see the people. If you were to stand right up next to the painting, you'd be seeing dots. And there are over a million dots that Surratt put on this, this canvas. And it was Surratt's idea that if he could mix colors, put two different colored dots right next to each other, as somebody stands back and views them, their eyes are going to be tricked into believing that it's actually a brighter or more vibrant color. And he was right. So on this, on this piece, you actually see over a million dots that create this scene. So it's a reimagination of an undesirable area. It was done point by point over two years. And the third thing that I want to point out is that um, while for many today it's known as one of the most popular pieces of work, when it was done and it went to exhibit, it was not well received. Uh, people did not, uh, they didn't want it in their galleries. They didn't want it to be something that they were associated with. There's a record of multiple museums um, voting, no, we're not going to bid on this piece of art. So at the time, there was this question, is this, is this a masterpiece or is this just a massive waste of time? Now, what I want to do, ne do next is draw some comparisons between um, this piece and the Palm Sunday account, which we're celebrating together today. So as we draw comparisons, I want to make sure that we read the account. And this is Matthew. It's uh, Matthew 21, verses 8 and 11. It says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So for Jesus, this is kind of like the beginning of the end of his uh, physical time on earth. This is his, uh, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And in the coming days, he would be betrayed by Judas. He would be handed over to the Romans. He would have an unfair trial that nobody was at. He would be put on a cross, and he would, he would die and, and be put in a tomb. And fortunately for us, we know that the story doesn't end there and that we have a, a risen God. But I want to draw some comparisons between the Palm Sunday account and this painting by Surratt. Oh, I want to back up just a little bit. All right.
All right, so the first one is that Jesus sees a corrupt world. In the text, Jesus is only, you know, a, a couple days away from, from death and a resurrection. So really the, his physical time on earth is coming to an end. And Jesus was, you know, about 33 years old at this point. So he's been around long enough to know and see firsthand how sinful the world is. You know, he looks over here and it's sin. And he looks over here and he sees it and it's sin. So Surat, let's think about him for a second. He looked at this landscape and it was not desirable. It was corrupt. There were issues with it. So we have a, a corrupt landscape and we have a corrupt world. Number two is that he begins to redeem it. So Jesus sees a corrupt world and he begins to redeem it. Knowing what was ahead of him in the coming days, Jesus still got on the donkey and went into Jerusalem. So you have the, the corrupt scene in which Surat says, we don't want Paris to be known for how dirty it is. We want it to be known for how pleasant it is. Jesus looks at the world and he says, the world is not going to be known for its sinfulness. The world is going to be known for my grace. So if Jesus sees a corrupt world, and he redeems it. And finally, we have this idea that time will tell. Now, there was a lot of confusion in the Palm Sunday account. You have people singing Hosanna to the son of David, and they're, they're calling him a king. And, and some in this crowd were believing that Jesus was coming in as the king of Israel, and that he was going to be a, an earthly, physical leader of their nation. You have others in the crowd who understood that Jesus wasn't going to be that at all, that he was going to be a heavenly king. And there were some who believed that when, when Jesus went up on the cross and as they, they nailed his hands and they put the, the thorn on his head, they believed that they were getting the last laugh at Jesus. They were not. Let's think about the painting here for a second. We talked about how it was not well received. It was, you know, so poorly received that um, after Surat had passed away, which was only seven years after he finished the painting, he died relatively young. After he passed away, uh, the painting really wasn't seen for like 30 years because it wasn't believed that it was something worth putting out. The thing is, time will tell, right? And time told and said, this is a masterpiece. And people thought that as Jesus died on the cross that, they were getting the last laugh at Jesus. But time told. As Jesus walked out of the, of the tomb. So Jesus sees a corrupt world. Jesus redeems it. And death does not get the last laugh on Jesus, but Jesus gets the last laugh on death. Now, I want to review these points here for just uh, one or two more minutes. We're talking about a, a corrupt world. And right now, or rather, has there ever been a time more than right now in which the world feels corrupt? We're at this unique point in history in which we have to ask ourselves questions such as, if I go to the grocery store, is, th is that going to be the place where I get this deadly virus? If, if I pick up this piece of paper, if I get this box off of my doorstep, is, is this item going to be the one that gives me the virus? See, more than ever, it, I think we can make the argument that the world certainly feels corrupt. But Jesus, again, says the world's not going to be known for how corrupt it is. The world's not going to be known for how sinful it is. The world is going to be known for Jesus and his grace. Now, I want to I wanna go back to Surat here talking about this idea that time will tell. Imagine that you um, go into Surat's studio as he's working on this, this painting. Let's say you walk in fairly early in the process and you see him you know, up on a ladder and he's got you know, just a handful of dots. And I'm not sure what the screen is doing, but I'm gonna keep going. He's got a handful of dots down and you look at him and think, what, what is he doing? And as you step back and over time he's placing more dots you begin to see the picture that he's creating. 
Now, sometimes it's really hard to see the good in the world and the good that Jesus is doing within our lives. So this idea that time will tell, sometimes we just need to stand back and wait for the whole picture to come into focus. And we need to trust Jesus that somewhere in this process, he is going to be working good in our lives, and he's going to be redeeming this broken and sinful world. So what I hope you're able to receive from this message is some encouragement. That if you can't see what Jesus is doing right now, time will tell. Time will tell how Jesus sees what's going on and how Jesus redeems. So be encouraged that God is not working against you, but that God is working for you. And if you can't see it right now, you'll see it because time will show it. So at this point in your homes, I would invite you to uh, fold your hands and to bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me. God, we thank you that you are a God who works for our good. Lord, you know the, uh, the sin that's in our world. You know the, uh, the sin that we deal with personally. You know the, the hardships that we deal with personally. Lord, we pray that you would continue to work for our good. And that even if we can't see the whole picture or the whole painting, that we would trust you knowing that you're going to place dots in a way that works for our good. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we bring the prayers of the church to you. As a united church and followers of Christ, we bring you our worries. We bring you our fears. We bring you our joys. And we look to you as our hope. We pray that while we are not able to worship together as one church, we would still seek out ways to serve as neighbors as one church. We pray for our leaders on every level and in every location. While many difficult decisions are being made, we pray that our leaders would lead with your wisdom and your discernment. We thank and praise you for the people risking their own health for the sake of others. We thank you for their great example of love and pray for their continued health as they serve your world. We pray for those in need um, of help and healing. We ask that they would receive your peace and patience in the ups and downs of their care and treatments. We pray for those in our world needing encouragement. We ask that they would feel your presence in their lives and that they will see the good work that you, Lord, are doing all around them. Jesus, you know all the prayers on our hearts. In complete confidence, we lift these prayers to you. Amen. Please join us in the praying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Amen.